I'm Suzanne Borsch. I'm the curator of uh, prints and drawings here in the gallery and the um, co-curator with Lucy Gelman. Lucy, are you here? She's there. Of the uh, exhibition called Vida y Drama de Mexico, which is up on the fourth floor of the, uh, what we call the old art gallery building. It's um, prints from the collection of Monroe and Aimee Price. And in connection with this uh, exhibition, we have a film showing which is about the Taller de Grafica, which is a Mexican uh, workshop from which most of the films, I mean, most of the objects in the exhibition uh, come. So uh, we have a very full program, so I'm going to ask that they start the film right now, and then after that we will, uh, some of us will come up on stage and we'll do more. Thank you. The taller began in 1937. It was started by Leopoldo Mendez, Luis Arenal, Alfredo Salce, Jose Chavez Morado, and Siqueiros, too. Anyhow, it was started by a bunch of people, and quickly they began to create an important body of work because the artists were tied to the unions, to the peasant groups, and their work was very varied and very intense. The TGP was born in a time of great effervescence, great change in Mexico. On the other hand, those who formed it were fighters, fighters who'd been active in the social movement. Many young people joined, many young people participated. But it's part of the change and of the thrust that was given to cultural work during that time. Not only in graphic arts, but also in music and film. It's a time in when the arts were blooming in this country, as well as the social and political changes that were taking place at that time. We lived in the time following the revolution. We lived in a time of peace. But still, the impact of the Mexican revolution was felt in the atmosphere. It was a Mexico that was nationalistic, a Mexico full of social and political protest. And that was precisely what motivated the lives of the artists. As a young artist, I would walk from my school to my house, and I'd find before me Diego Rivera painting in the Palacio Nacional. It was profoundly emotional, in full view of the public, in the patios of the Palacio Nacional. I'd walk a bit further and I'd find José Clemente Orozco in the Iglesia de Jesús, developing a concept that was mystical, deep, but totally relevant to the time, to that moment in which we were living in Mexico. So all that was what was shaping me and filling me with social and artistic interest. That moment couldn't have been better in the life of Mexico. Refugees began arriving in Mexico from all parts of the world. The bulk of the Great Migration was of Spanish Republicans, which is without a doubt the most important migratory phenomenon of the 20th century. But afterwards, those who arrived in Mexico were persecuted Austrians, Hungarians, Germans. 
Well, people arrived who, in some cases, already had well-established cultural, political, scientific, and professional lives. Doctors arrived, philosophers arrived, and all types of people arrived. There was a time when people were interested in social art and not just expressing themselves, but doing something like the mural paintings and so forth. And they were very interested in what was going on in Mexico. So they came, and some visited the taller. And because I was an Afro-American living here, they were always knocking at my door. <laughs> There was freedom of the press. There was also very, very strong criticism that, well, it was part of democratic change that was developing during that time. The possibility that everyone could express themselves, organize themselves, participate to say what they believed, be it in favor of or against the government. We worked collectively, as you probably know. And we would bring in the work that we were working on and discuss it and have criticism. We were very concerned about everything that was going on in the neighborhoods of Mexico City. We went all around the city to draw. And then on Fridays, when the taller met, we would discuss what we had seen what interested us. Sometimes we would collaborate in collective works, and in these cases, we didn't really have anyone telling us what we needed to do. But we were guided by the opinions of our colleagues. If an artist was responsible to create a piece of work, then that artist, after considering these opinions, may or may not amend that point of view. So that discussion was very democratic. That system of presenting our project, of listening to others' opinions, weren't harsh, as you might imagine. On the contrary, they were deeply stimulating. It was a positive criticism. For instance, somebody would say, why have you hidden the hands on that, on that man? And the artist said, well, I can't do hands. So they said, well, I'll do the hands. It didn't matter who worked. People worked together on prints. It didn't matter. The idea was to do the best art possible, use the best symbolism possible, and not who had done the work. A lot of it was not signed even. They just put in TGP. The Taller de Grafica Popular wasn't an organization made up of only one party. In reality, there were different currents. There were different influences. Those of us who were in the Communist Party and those of us who were in the Popular Party. We had our differences, which were discussed quite pleasantly sometimes. And other times, they were very heated discussions. Even as someone who was on the periphery, I was attentive and knew what was going on there. I soaked it all up. I liked always being in the midst of the development of their ideas. They weren't merely being creative. Their creations were the product of discussion about how to best represent their ideas through graphic art for a message against war, for a message against totalitarianism, a message against bombs, a message to end killing and massacres, a search for how to fight and how they fought in the past in Mexico. That's why they depicted the Mexican Revolution in a lot of their work. We couldn't have expressed anything more than our passionate protest at that time. We as artists 
were very involved in all the politics and life in Mexico. The use of the graphic material was very important. So they would do, for example, they did this before I came. They illustrated a series of books in the different Indian languages so people could learn to read and write in their own language. And then to learn to read and write in Spanish. Photography reached its highest form of expression when it was behind an ideology, when an ideology propelled it. Here we can see no less than what precisely motivated the members of the TGP so much the analysis of the Mexican Revolution. This type of treatment, how the peons on the hacienda were punished, this represents the synthesis of something that tells us a lot about what the artist thought and what the TGP devoted itself to. They were sent to work all across the country. For example, Beltran and Mexiac were in the Chamula region. Beltran made illustrations there for a book called Juan Perez Olote about the life of a Chamula person. I was among the first in our group to help indigenous people no longer fear those who had exploited them, the mestizos. What we witnessed during that time was truly painful. And so after many years, those indigenous groups, little by little, began to gain social consciousness. That's why in 1984, when there was the indigenous uprising, many of us who had worked over there really felt that our labor had positive effects. Because those people now had an awareness of who they were. In Mexico, it's very common to talk about indigenous rights, but they're still discriminated against. That's why I will always support giving indigenous people their rightful place within society. And I've always been for that. Mexia made a print where a person's mouth is bound with a lock and chain. He made it in 1954 to challenge and criticize the politics of a North American named McCarthy, who led the persecution of communists. So the lithograph was made against that type of behavior. And afterwards, it was adopted by the student movement of 1968. Also, another lithograph, one by Garcia Bustos, depicts a soldier on horseback who has a demonstrator pinned down on the ground. The conservative groups who were in the government, in the regime, organized periods of repression that were very dramatic, like the famous 2nd of October, which was a bloodbath for the Mexican people that can never be forgotten. The TGP wanted, above all, for its message to be accessible to the worker, that it could reach the peasant. We had a direct relationship with people in Mexico, rural people and urban people. And they knew that they could get work from the Taina. We would have to raise money sometimes to do the printing. It was a wonderful organization. Many members of the TGP participated in what in those days was called the cultural brigades. These were mainly brigades of teachers, teachers of different disciplines who went out to the rural communities to promote the development of those communities, to educate the people. We helped with literacy. They had literacy uh, programs. We helped with that. We helped with building schools. We helped with the corn production. We helped with peasants getting the prevailing price for beans or for corn 
and not giving them to middlemen at a lower price. Things like that we work with the government, but they didn't pay us. Mi acercamiento al taller fue por The way that I became involved with the TGP was by helping Ignacio Aguirre and Pablo O'Higgins on a mural that they were creating in Tarrasquillo in the state of Mexico. Well, they saw that I was an enthusiastic kid and they invited me to join the taller. Once there, I saw that they had lithographic stones that I could do my drawings there. There was a person there who had an extraordinary ability to make prints, Jose Sanchez, who in fact was missing an arm. He was the one who would press our copies for us. So I started to work making lithographs in the taller. That's where I grabbed the first tools and on small pieces of linoleum that some of my colleagues would give me, I started to create little works, which in fact, Mariana Yampolsky who was in charge of organizing the exhibitions, would place next to the other's work. In the case of Mariana, she had a Russian father who was a sculptor, and a German mother who both lived in the United States. As a young person, Mariana began to feel dissatisfied with her university studies in the United States, in Illinois, where she was born. She heard about the TGP and that it was doing work for disenfranchised people which could transcend what she had been doing with her artistic expression. The artists of that time had a big influence in the development of different branches of art all over the world. Diverse groups of people came to the TGP from the United States, Latin America, Europe. Among the people I remember from when I had just joined the taller was Moshe Gat, who I know is an important artist in Israel. I was an artist in New York City. I applied for a Rosenwald grant. At that time, it was the only grant that black artists could get. And my project was to do a series of prints, paintings, and sculpture on black women. Because they had only been represented either as servants or exotic people in art. And I thought it was time to show them as the hardworking and heroic people that they are. One of the members of the jury told me, you should get out of New York City. <laughs> So the natural place for me to come, and I had a, it wasn't a big grant, so I came to Mexico. Nosotros escogimos Oaxaca para we chose uh, Oaxaca to develop our work. Desarrollar nuestro trabajo sábados y domingos. Saturdays and Sundays, we would visit markets close to the city. One of the most interesting towns we saw was Tlacolula. So every Sunday, I would bring my notepad, as I always do, to make notes and observations. Upon returning, I had recognized that the bread market was very beautiful and that it had to be highlighted because of its primitive way, because of the indigenous groups who took care of the place. All that fascinated us. In 1954, the distinguished art critic Luis Cardoza y Aragón invited me to come to Guatemala, which is the land where Rina was born, and where an important revolutionary experience was developing. They noticed not just the cultural types, but also the politicians, that lithography has a direct connection with an illiterate population, like the one that was in Guatemala. And they created lithographic works in the style of the Taller de Grafica Popular, 
who, in earlier times, had really provided Mexico with posters for the unions, for all the political movements that were in this country. I produced a collection of 11 lithographs about the development of what I could observe during that time. And I called it Testimonio de Guatemala. The lithograph, Corazón de América, is part of that collection. It's the beautiful and bucolic landscape of Guatemala, which is being run over by a weapon. La oración indígena, yo la realicé en San Cristóbal de las Casas. I created la oración indígena in San Cristóbal de las Casas, Chiapas. It is a scene from daily life in the church of Chamula. The indigenous people go there to pray, to light candles, to drink alcohol in the temple. That's what they do as part of their ritual. It's very common to see that happening, even today. They bring incense. The place is magical. The temple has an aroma of pine needles, which have been crushed by the indigenous people as they walk on them. Because the pine needles are spread out on the floor, like a carpet. So in Chiapas, I created many lithographs like that one, La Oración Indígena, because I lived there for three years in San Cristóbal de las Casas. Eran un grupo it was a combative group of people, a group of people who fought to make their country better and bring about a better quality of life. We participated in the festivities of the 15th of September, where the statue of Miguel Aleman was painted. They painted it as a protest, and so the authorities caught wind of all this. And when they decided to take over the university, they went looking for people who stood out, who were involved in the movement. They came looking for me here in this house. At midnight, five policemen arrived dressed up as students. They rang the doorbell. I thought they were my nephews who were students. I opened the door and they came in and they were looking for both of us, but they only found me, and they took me to jail that very night. They kept looking for Arturo, but since he was at the Taller de Grafica Popular at that time, with Jose Sanchez, making some posters to be used for that movement, he wasn't home, even though it was midnight. And at midnight, the police left and they didn't take him, thank goodness, only me. And with how terrible something like that can be, it was actually a very interesting experience because I was able to get to know the movement from the inside as a political movement, which for an artist provides motivation that needs to be expressed. That is why I have lithographs that I made in that moment. In fact, I drew them right there in the women's prison. All the women who were there, how interesting all their stories were. While I was in there, I got to hear terrible tales from each one of the women prisoners who would tell us about their lives. I was harassed by the United States Embassy. Uh, they called me in to see about citizenship and asked me, and told me that I had to make out a list of all the communists I knew. If I didn't do it, I couldn't get any help from the embassy for anything. They would regard me as a non-citizen. And I didn't do it. And I didn't hear anything from them for some time. And then I was arrested one night when there was a strike of the railroad workers. Somebody knocked at the door. We lived on the third floor. When I went to the door, there was a dark man smelling like tequila. And I thought it was a tourist. But he said, we're from Gobernación, and we want to see your papers. My oldest son was standing by me with some red pajamas. And 
All of a sudden, you said you're coming with us, and you grabbed my arm and twisted me around and put his hand under my foot, arm under my foot, and marched me out into the hall where there were three other men. And two of them took me by the arms and lifted me up off the floor. I was in bed and slippers and a sweater, luckily. And the other one was behind. He was knocking down my oldest son who was trying to stop him. He was about, I don't know, 10. And they just carried me down and out and put me in a car between two of them. And we drove around the city and they threatened me. Finally, they pulled up at a house. And they put my hands behind me. They took me in and sat me down and took out a list of names on some very nice paper and signed and, and checked me off. I was the third one. And they evidently were arresting the whole list because they said they were all Americans and many of them I knew, whose names I knew were refugees here from the McCarthy movement. Like Dalton Trumbo and Albert Maltz, people that worked in Hollywood, a lot of them were. I was in there Friday night, Saturday and Sunday. And, and I mean, some people came by and brought me things. My little boy called Pablo O'Higgins, and he went out to where my husband was singing and playing the guitar at this party and that broke up. Everybody went out to see who could get me out of the jug. I was in with two Cuban women and a German woman. The two Cubans, one was telling the other one's fortune. And I said, tell mine. So she said, well, you crossed my palm with silver. So I gave her a 50 cent piece. She said, make a wish. You know what I wished to get out of there. So, because I didn't know whether they were going to deport me, I hadn't heard anything from anybody except some people that were using German material and some cigarettes. I was smoking there. So she said, You're going to get your wish. And just then somebody beat on the door, and the guard said, Senor, it's a bit silly con tos sus chivas. Come out with all your junk. In the case of the railroad workers, the political prisoners, we should remember that one of them belonged to the TGP, David Alfaro Siqueiros. That is to say, when there was a time of strong repression in my country, my father very insistently argued before the governments, specifically of Lopez Mateos and of Gustavo Diaz Ordaz, so that the political prisoners be liberated. It was one of the moments which put him at odds politically with those governments. His insistence that freedom be given to those who were made prisoners for political reasons. But returning to the TGP and its people, they were without a doubt important activists in support of the movement of 68, of the students, and in general to the resurgence of the popular movements in the country. So for the next part of the program, um, I thought we could have um, Octavio Blanco and uh, Rivka Amy uh, speak a little bit about the making of the film. Uh, and then uh, Deborah Caplo is going to show some slides and Monroe is going to show some slides. And, uh, and then 
then we will all go up on stage. But I was realizing if we all go up on stage now, we can't see the slides. But let me first uh, introduce uh, the speakers. Um, uh, Rivka Aini um, is a New York-based filmmaker and musician. She is passionate about social justice and <clears throat> improving the lives of people through communication and art. And Rivka, as you saw, co-produced, co shot, and edited this film. And, <coughs> and she tells uh, me that she will <coughs> soon be producing a new life. Um, uh, now, <laughs> right. uh, Octavia Blanco is an online editor at CNN and uh, is the co-producer of this uh, film. Uh, he is the vice president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, uh, New York chapter. He also is passionate about news from Latin America and is working to bring more balanced coverage from the region to the U.S. for English-speaking audiences. He also, uh, this film was made in connection with the showing of a collection that his family has uh, in Maryland, and he also is currently working to organize a New York exhibition of that collection and uh, more showings of, of this film. Now, let me just uh, quickly uh, say uh, Deborah Kaplow, who will be the next speaker, uh, is an art historian and of interdisciplinary arts and sciences at the University of Washington. Uh, she specializes in Mexican art of the 20th century and especially of Mexican political art. And she is the author of uh, a major monograph on, uh, on Leopoldo Mendes, who was the founder or one of several co-founders and but really the most important uh, actor uh, person in the history of the Tierra de Grafica. Um, uh, then Monroe Price, uh, who is, besides being the donor of the collection that you can see upstairs, him, he and his wife, uh, Amy, are the donors. Uh, Amy um, is the author, she's an art historian and is the author of Pierre Privy de Chavannes, a book that was published uh, in 2010 by Yale University Press. Uh, Monroe is the director of the Center for Global Communication Studies at the Annenberg School for Co Communication at the University of Pennsylvania, also a professor of law and I believe the former dean of the Benjamin Cardozo School of Law in New York. And finally, um, last but certainly not least, uh, Noah Bardock is an expert on Mexican political graphics and the director of uh, something called graficamexicana.com. This is an online uh, catalog of the prints made by the Taller de Grafica. Uh, Noah did an undergraduate thesis on, uh, on this material and, and got a doctorate also uh, called Post-Revolutionary Art, Revolutionary Artists. Mexican political art collectives from 1921 to 1960, and he got that doctorate in 2008. Uh, he now lives in Los Angeles and is a CEO of some tech companies, but he is, his passion is this material. So let me uh, give the stage to Octavio uh, and, and Rivka. I'm not quite sure if you'll talk in unison or, or quite what. But. I'm Octavio uh, Blanco, and before I start, I just really want to thank Virgilio Blanco, who's in, in the audience. Uh, he was the executive producer of the film. He's my father, but uh, without his work, uh, he researched all the artists. He's the collector of the TGP work in Maryland. He uh, got in touch with all of the artists. Um, he interviewed them, so all the answers that you saw there were being given to Virgilio, who was sitting off camera. So it's really uh, the brainchild of Virgilio to make this, uh, this, this film. Uh, Rivka and I were fortunate enough to be able to help it become a reality. So Virgilio, stand up and so people can see who you are.
Thank you, and thank you to Yale University and Suzanne and everybody for having us here. Um, and rather than, uh, than, I just want to say that, you know, it's so, so good to, to be able to show this film. It's been um, uh, dormant for a long time. Uh, it was produced in 2008 um, in conjunction with a uh, showing that we did in Maryland at the Howard Community College down there. Um, and it's really uh, amazing to be here at Yale University and showing it to all you uh, good people. Um, it's given me and Rivka, I think, uh, uh, a shot in the arm to try to uh, push this a little bit further. And so as, as uh, Suzanne said, I am looking now um, to uh, bring the collection to New York and to have more screenings in New York. Uh, but it's, uh, very, it was very important to us, um, and Rivka can maybe talk about this a little bit. We, we created this when we were, uh, we both lived in Inwood in uh, New York City, which is one of the, uh, it, was, it was an up and coming neighborhood. Uh, we lived in an artist community. We had a lot of artistic friends. The voiceovers that you saw in the film were uh, other artists that lived in, in Inwood. Um, and it was, we liked the idea that we were creating this film about a art community in Mexico and utilizing our own art community to, to realize it, so. Okay, uh, so yeah, while I didn't know much about Mexican art until Virgilio came to us with this idea to shoot this documentary, I had been doing social documentary for some years and like Octavia mentioned, we knew a lot of other people in the community through, through music, through graphic arts and film and when, so it just seemed like a natural fit to go and both shoot and edit the film and also involve the people in our community to be part of it. And the film, the art, it's all, even though it was about a specific artist, you know, um, era, a collective that existed, you know, within that time, it's still relevant today and it'll probably still be relevant for many, many years. Um, so, you know, till there's no longer power struggles like they, they show in the film. <laughs> right. So. So for that reason, we want to, now that it's kind of been revived, we want to see where we could take it, linking it to current movements of artists who are trying to use their art for social purposes. Yeah, we were lucky enough just recently to um, meet people in New York City who have a, a, a taller, and they're called Dominican New York. And it turns out that there are Dominican Americans uh, living in Manhattan and uh, creating lithographs. Um, and they are utilizing, uh, the mo they are modeled around the Taller de Grafica Popular, which um, was incredible to me because if not for my father, I'm sure that I probably would not have heard of the Taller uh, de Grafica Popular. But it turns out that there's a, a long history and uh, longevity to the idea of collaborative work. And um, so the exhibit that we're planning together um, is going to bridge those two worlds, the past, uh, what you see, what you saw on the screen, and the present, what is going on today in the graphic arts movement. So they're still doing lithography, you know, where they're taking tools and carving them out and making lithographs, but there might be uh, digital art and all other types of modern, uh, what we might nowadays know as street art. So if you have any questions, please ask. I don't know how long you want us to be up here, but I know that you have a later. OK. Sounds good. Thank you very much. And all the organizers of the show and all the co-participants. Um, it's a wonderful show. I'm just really, really pleased to see it here and excited to be here and excited about all of the recent increase in interest in the TGP. It's been something I've been studying for the last 25 years, and um, I've seen a sudden and wonderful surge of interest, and as Octavio was saying, it's probably because it's more relevant than ever. Um, so I wanted to emphasize the work of Leopoldo Mendez because that's um, the person about whom I wrote my book, which is on the table, and people can come and look at it after the um, program. <coughs> But Leopoldo Mendez was one of the three people who founded the TGP. It wasn't the first political artist organization he founded. He also founded a group called the League of Revolutionary Artists and Writers in 1934. But he was really an inspiration to everybody, and he was acknowledged as the most important 
printmaker of that group, but also he was actually the president of the TGP for many years, year after year after year, and the person who put the most work into it and um, kept it together. Although the other members were equally important and um, skilled and very much um, part of, they were all part of a collective, he still had this extremely strong role and is now acknowledged as being a very important uh, member of the group and his work really is outstanding. So you see him here in the 1930s wearing workers' overalls. Part of the um, identity of the group was their identification with the workers of Mexico, and many of them were um, thought of themselves as cultural workers, as people have in revolutionary movements and societies, and he especially thought that way about himself and about his work and about the uh, audience for his work. Um, he, the people in the taller did um, many different types of work, they were very inspired by the printmaker Jose Guadalupe Posada, who came before them and was discovered in the 1920s. Um, but they were also inspired by European artists like Goya. And um, uh, the print here is a print that Mendez made about the assassination of a number of school teachers during the 1930s by right wing Cristero. Um, uh, fanatics who were thinking that the school teachers were destroying Mexican culture by teaching socialist education and uh, sex education in the schools and godless communism. But um, as Noah points out in his dissertation, this is very much like a Goya print. And many of uh, Mendez's prints show reference to Goya. He was also very fond of Katie Kolbitz and another printmaker named Franz Mazarel. So you see these resonances in the um, work of the tire in general, along with um, some of the photo montage artists from Europe who were influencing them, like John Hartfield. Um, the, they also used a great deal of humor. This is the one print I put in my uh, PowerPoint that is in the show, and this is by the very talented Jose Chavez Morado, who I think is the most uh, bitingly satirical in this uh, sort of fantastical way, phantasmagoric is the word that Noah was using as we were looking um, at the show. And this is um, the clergy and the press. So it's a, it's a satire about the, the collaboration between Mexican Catholic clergy and right-wing um, newspaper uh, reporters. And then um, the influence of Posada was really strong and uh, he was, uh, Mendez idolized him as did many other Mexican artists of the 19, of 1920s, 1930s, up to the 1970s, up to the present actually. Posada is very, very much admired as a quintessentially Mexican artist. Um, so there was this constant oscillation between the local, the national, and the international in the TGP, and Mendez was certainly one of those people um, who was very, very international. Um, and this was a print he made, a very large print in 1956 that shows Posada in his workshop, and it um, takes it into the realm of the Mexican Revolution by including the Flores Magón brothers, who were the intellectual precursors of the Mexican Revolution. The date on the wall is 1902, and the text in the hand of the um, uh, political politician, political theorist on the left is a denunciation of forced conscription into the army. And outside the window, Mendez has put a view of people being forced um, into conscription, but it's actually a, a, a reworking of one of Posada's actual prints. So he has Posada making his own print while he's sitting at his workshop, and he's also referring to something that Diego Rivera said about art in general, that art should be a weapon. And you see that expressed by Posada's dagger-like printmaking tool in his hand. So you have this kind of multi-layered, um, incredibly a complex print that refers to many different things at the same time, and as a kind of a catalog of Posada's and Mendez's printmaking strokes and techniques. It's really very complex. And this is one of the reasons I admire Mendez, is the complexity of his work, and um, also he was extremely prolific and produced many different kinds of work. Um, this is a print by Posada that Mendez um, knew very well. He was a collector and specialist in Posada. Later in life, he turned to making art books in Mexico. He, found, he was the founder of the first art book publishing company in Mexico and published the first book that illustrated the Mexican uh, political murals and the uh, first large scale book about Posada and first big book about Mexican folk art and so on. 
Um, but he was um, directly referring to Goya, Colvitz, Posada, et cetera. This is um, his Don Quixote, and this is a type of motif called a calavera. And um, interestingly, the Taller also did many, many calaveras on a regular basis. It was one of their favorite techniques. The exhibit upstairs doesn't have calaveras because it's um, concentrating on a different type of political pose, or much, much more um, direct, referential, kind of serious look at various, um, very specific circumstances that the exhibit is um, very strong, very, very strong about that. And it was very interesting to me to see the um, kind of emphasis that that exhibit has. It's a really great look of that aspect of the TGP. Um, but they also made many calaveras, and as you can see, this one by Mendez, which is a reference to the Second World War, the, it's a reference to the Russian general Timoshenko defeating the Nazis in the Battle, Battle of Stalingrad, goes directly f from this print and a couple of other ones of calaveras on horseback. Um, he also was part of the group of the TGP who, uh, members who produced very, very striking images for a remarkable book called The Black Book of Nazi Terror in Europe, El Libro Negro del Terror Nazi in Europa, in 1943, in the spring of 1943. And they were asked by the German community exile to produce or to contribute images. Most of them had been produced earlier, but these images referred directly to the war in Europe. and. Um, in the case of the Holocaust, there are three images in the book that refer directly to the Holocaust. And this is one by Mendes, Mendes called the Deportation to Death. And it shows the absolutely remarkable uh, awareness that these artists had of international politics. They were receiving reports from Europe on a monthly, daily, weekly basis. Um, they read a magazine called Futuro that was put out by the Workers' University in Mexico City. And throughout the year 1942, more and more information was published in Futuro about the death camps and then about Auschwitz and the gas chambers. And by the time Mendez made this print, he knew about Auschwitz and he was actually referring directly to the deportation of Jews to the death camps. And you can see the kind of um, nighttime scene of German soldiers loading people into boxcars, terrified looking villagers. And at one end of the print is a smoke that comes from the locomotive, but is actually um, eerily reminiscent of the smoke of the crematoria. So he was doing something again that's very sophisticated. Um, there are photographs in the Mendez archives of tr actual Mexican trains that he used as models for this train. So he did a lot of research and study as well as learning about it from European sources. And then at the end of the war, Mendez produced what I consider to be his masterpiece, really, a, a beautiful wood engraving, a very difficult technique, a self-portrait that encapsulates the whole of his career in some ways and shows the dilemma of the political artist at the end of the Second World War. The real heyday, in some ways, of the Taller de Grafica Popular was the um, 1940s when they produced so much anti-fascist work of very, very high quality. And um, he shows himself with the Mexican, the symbol that's in the middle of the Mexican flag, the eagle on the cactus with a snake in its mouth is the symbol of the Mexican people. But here the snake has become free and the eagle is crucified on a swastika and a procession that is both a Catholic procession from the conquest of Mexico in the 1500s and a, a procession of fascist soldiers that's make, making its way in the distance toward Mexico City. The artist himself is sitting on what looks to be a portfolio of Posada's work, and he's looking into the f distance as though he's looking to the future, trying to decide what his next step will be. Um, the work of Mendez um, after the war became um, a little bit more uh, multi-dimensional in some ways, not quite as focused on fascism, and some of his work actually critiques m modern media. This is a very, very remarkable print that he did in the 1940s, um, late 1940s, uh, in which he's commenting on the medium, very new me medium of television. And he's, um, like mo most of the prints of the TGP, focusing on the division between the, the haves and the haves not. And here he's talking about it as being a part of the new medium of t TV, with the poor um, looking at a shop window where there's a television and the wealthy are in the television um, celebrating by drinking champagne and eating steak. 
Um, and here, again, he's using Calaveras humorously and very, very seriously. Um, the, um, in the 1950s, he was very um, focused on trade unions, and he did this wonderful um, print of, uh, in support of striking miners um, in a, a strike that was eventually put down rather brutally by the government. But um, again, he's referring back to European art here because it's directly taken um, from some of Goya's prints in the disasters of war. Um, the rifles coming in from the side is one of the prints from that series by Goya. And then um, he also could be very humorous and refer to pre-Columbian art. Um, this is part of a book that he published around the same time as the Black Book of Nazi Terror, which won a book prize um, in that year it's called Incidentes Melódicos del Mundo Irracional, and it had a text by a, a writer named Juan de la Cabada in Mayan and Spanish with um, lyrics and, uh, and music. And in this text, he used a lot of pre-Columbian imagery, including this snake. Um, and the story is very charming. The, the little snail woman who knows how to sing and has a squirrel husband. It's just a, a, kind of like a little folk tale, but it's also about uh, oppression and injustice, kind of disguise, a disguised um, tale of that topic. And then um, the, the last point I want to make here is the con continuation, uh, which is something Octavio and Rivka were talking about, how inspiring his work and work of the TGP continues to be today. This is a poster that was produced in 1992 without attribution um, that is, um, the, the, it says here, um, but, the 12th of October, which in some communities, including Seattle, where I live, has now been called Indigenous Peoples Day. It's officially Indigenous Peoples Day instead of Columbus Day now. And um, in Mexico, many people object to the idea of Columbus discovering America. So it's called, it, the text up there says the 12th of October, 1992, 500 years after the invasion, um, we continue to resist because, and then at the bottom, is a verse from the Popol Vuh, and it says, they tore, out, they tore off our fruits, they cut our branches, they burned our trunk, but they couldn't kill our roots. And I've also seen the same poster with the EZLN at the top, the uh, liberation movement from Chiapas. So it's been repurposing, which, ha which is happening, happened at the time of the boom of the TGP. They repurposed their own work, and now it's also repurposed by many other people so here we see something that was done in Oaxaca in 2006 as part of the incredible explosion of stencil, graffiti, and printmaking in Oaxaca, which, in which Posada, Mendez, and the TGP are main influences. So I wanted to show you this one as the final slide to show you how it comes completely into the present with the Calavera helicopters hovering over the people of Oaxaca. So, um, just to show you that it really is a completely relevant um, uh, art form and will continue to be for a long time. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say first on behalf of uh, my wife and me, what a great honor it is to be here to, have, to see this exhibit, to see the work that has gone into it by Yale and, and sort of the, the extraordinary nature of being in a, a university art gallery and a university art gallery of the quality of this one, to, to take work uh, like the, the work of the Taller and breathe additional historical fact into it, to weave it together in a story, to involve the students and the faculty in this exhibition. So I, I know I'm speaking for MA, who may say a few words later, but the. Um, we're, we're, this has been a great moment for us, and we're really pleased with the with the exhibit itself. Uh, my my, I'm I'm going to speak almost as a collector and not as an expert on the TGP. And I, uh, it, it was really a great thing for us that the show is titled uh, "Work from the Collection of Amy and Monroe Price." And I was trying to think about what does this mean? Do we really have a collection? What is how how did this come to be, and what is the theme of it? And in a sense. I, I, I want to take some words that uh, came from the film. Th this is about the use of art as engagement, the use of art as a motivating force, the use of art 
And not always by, from the bottom up, sometimes from the top down as propaganda. So th it seems to me this animates a lot of the work that we were interested in in collecting. And I wanted to just show a few things from drawers that were next to the drawers that uh, occupied, were occupied by the TGP. So I look at this as, in our apartment, friends of the TGP in some way. So the TGP would war with some of these uh, images and would have uh, agreement with others. So this, uh, I'll just go through a few of these, because they also emphasize a notion that I like from the show. The show is not about the big three. It's not about Orozco and uh, Rivera and, yes. and Siqueiros. It's about artists who have less of a reputation, who are extraordinarily important but are not household words. And this is also a theme that I think we have followed in some ways. So this is by Edmund Bill, and it's a Totentanz of 1919. And, it's, uh, I, I, and this is um, General Ludd. This is by a Hungarian artist named Utz Bela, and it's about 1923. He was on the wrong side of, the, of, a, of a communist division in Hungary, but he portrayed, he did a series of work on the Luddites, and I, I, it's not exactly the same as the Tayyar de Grafica Popular, but you can see this effort to try to develop what you, you spoke of, it, which was a direct contact with the, with the audience. How do, how do you speak directly to an audience? This is a, a, an artist who's one of my favorites, a woman named Renata geisberg wichmann who did this in 1942 in Germany. And it's an extraordinary work. And these, these um, again, uh, very direct, very strong, very important, and in, in that way, it, to me, ties to the TGP. This is uh, a, a different kind of propaganda. This is the status propagandist. This is uh, a, a poster uh, which uh, I, I, I was interested in. It's from the thaw period uh, of um, the Soviet Union, and it's part of a series of posters we have which were uh, an exhibition at uh, Penn, Grinnell, and USC. This is uh, a work by a Ukrainian master artist named Kasyan, and this is a worker who built, helped build the Kiev subway. And so, um, again, the idea of labor, but a different way of thinking about labor, glorification of labor, but not necessarily of the unions, not looking at it as a, as a battle. This, these next two are just a different kind of propaganda, a propaganda of pleasure, a propaganda of sort of increasing loyalty in some ways. This is a Soviet work, and this is a Chinese work. Again, seeing some commonalities of, uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a way of thinking about uh, increasing emotion, increasing loyalty, et cetera, et cetera. Very different from the TGP, but in some way related in the sense of purpose and directness of the role of the artist. Uh, this is uh, called HMS Repulse. It's by an artist named Barnett Friedman, and it's about uh, mobilizing British uh, enthusiasm during the early days of World War II. Um, again, you'll see a lot of work which is ab about conflict and war and, and encouraging loyalties. This is one of my most recent acquisitions. It's a child's drawing of a uh, person being tortured in a, a Japanese internment camp in China. And it says, if your hands are tied behind your back, resist or die. I, this is um, a very unusual piece. This is about a dance night in a prison of war camp in the Philippines by an artist named Clyde Singer. Quite, quite nice piece, I, I like it a lot. Um, this is a book cover of a book by Zola called Germinal, uh, 1926 in Russia. Uh, it's about coal miners. Again, an, to me, an interesting piece. This, this is one of my favorite things, which is a paper bag from Addis Ababa. And it's um, bought in the market there for about a penny. And it's made out of recycled class books teaching English and math to Ethiopian children. And uh, so th these were recycled books. 
in, turned into paper bags. I don't know whether I'd call this propaganda, but I like it anyway, so I thought I'd throw it into the slide <laughs> package. And this is um, uh, a funeral of a government official in Romania, um, in the, probably in the 70s or, or 60s, at a time of unrest. So you see these figures cowering by the windows. It, it, it has some relationship to the TGP because it's about the kind of fright of authority, authority wondering about its future, about being overthrown, et cetera. This is a, a piece that's really about etiquette in the Soviet Union. And in, in that sense, it's a different kind of teaching. It's a, it's a way of, of uh, educating people as to customs, et cetera. I, again, I like this image. And th this is a Pol Polish uh, farm, tractors. And these, I'm going to show these two images, uh, which I, Amy and I both love. These are paintings done by Iraqi artists of American soldiers and their families based on snapshots that were given to Iraqi artists in the green zone and then turned into paintings, uh, et cetera. And uh, it's a really interesting art form that nobody knows much about. Uh, this is American propaganda. This is Nancy Harkness Love, who was one of the first uh, American women Air Force officers. And I threw it in because her, she's a Harkness. I think she may be a Yale Harkness and lesser known person. So I thought maybe the new Yale College could be named after Nancy Harkness Love. Uh, and this is, these are, again, it's a kind of cousin to the TGP. These are French resistance, I, I think, I'm not totally sure about this, but I think these, this is sort of French workers or French post-resistance after World War II. This is, I think, more in the 1950s. So it's not exactly resistance. But uh, again, I think I see in, it, it's a kind of class of art uh, that I think is interesting about directness, uh, mobilization, education, et cetera. And this is the, it's, I'm particularly partial to this. This is the, a series of, of um, lithographs based on the building of the television tower in Dresden. And it, it's a recognition of the power of the medium. I was glad to see the, in Deborah's talk, the, uh, the picture of the television set. Uh, and uh, this symbolizes the importance of the media to, to authority and the creation of this great icon and, and, and the idea of having a commissioning lithographs that just show the building of this thing. This is my last slide. This is the chosen successor to Mao Zedong. Uh, and it says, long life to Mao Zedong, long life to Mao Zedong. So this is a series of interesting slides about propaganda and directness, which is not TGP, but in my view, inspired by it. And as I say, they're neighbors of the TGP in the drawers and under the bed and of, of, of our house. So thank you very much. So uh, we have a bit, a bit more time here, and actually I'd like to get uh, Noah Bardock to talk, but I did want to say before everybody, I mean, I did want to say because I forgot to say that uh, both the prices are Yale graduates. Um, Monroe is an undergrad and graduated from Yale Law School actually uh, 50 years ago in 1964, so that uh, we're celebrating uh, that. And Amy has her PhD from the Art History um, Graduate School at Yale. Um, but now everyone has spoken except you, Noah. So if, <laughs> if you have some thoughts about the film, how it relates to what you know, because you know the TGP and its predecessors uh, better, and that's what you wrote about, um, I was wondering if what we saw, these artists that we saw, uh, Mexiak and Catlett, et mm -hmm. cetera, if they, Yes. We're really carrying on what the TGP was like at the very beginning, or had it already changed some by the 50s? That's a great question. When they got so going. The, the TGP itself is really uh, 
part of a, a progression of graphic development in Mexico, uh, and in particular, political graphic collectives. So uh, graphic artists who uh, were political actors and felt uh, fervently about their leftist politics and formed collectives uh, to express one uh, aspect of that political belief or another. And the TGP, in many ways, is the, is the most refined version of that. Uh, before that, as Deborah mentioned, there was the League of Revolutionary Writers and Artists. Uh, there was the uh, proletariat intellectual struggle. There was the 30-30 uh, group, which was actually named after a a popular carbine uh, rifle that was popular in the revolution. Um, so the, the TGP, by the time these artists come to the TGP, they're in many cases very mature uh, as political artists. And not just as, as political artists, but as political actors. Um, these were, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine a group of artists who were so politically active. Um, and I think that was the, these were people who marched in the streets these were people who uh, took place in protests. As Elizabeth said, these were people who were persecuted for their politics, who were arrested for their politics. Um, at one point, uh, artists of and allied with the, the TGP actually tried to assassinate Trotsky. That was the, the first attempt on Trotsky's life in, uh, in Mexico in 1940. Um, they had uh, firebombs and dynamite and uh, machine guns. And so when we say that they're political actors, it's not just that they did a lot of political art, they actually were in the streets and, and uh, trying to change the, the course of history. Um, that was the spirit that was brought to the TGP in 1937, and I think that spirit continued all the way through. Uh, the politics changed, the ideas changed, the parties changed, the actors changed, but I think uh, for Mexiac and Beltran and Garcia Bustos, many of whom, and Catlett, are kind of part of a second generation uh, in the TGP, I think that they were committed, just as the original founders were, to political activism, uh, and not just through art, but through action. Um, hope that answers your um, question. Yes, yeah. I didn't, don't know if anybody else has a particular comment on, on that. Um, actually, um, Deborah, I was very interested in your last slide, because um, tomorrow there will be a brochure for the show. It's just, just coming off the press, unfortunately. It's not, not ready now, but it will be by, by 10 a.m. tomorrow. And uh, in there, I mention, or I quote, an article by someone named Carmen Bulosa. I don't know if that's a name that's known to you, but she's a, a Mexican writer. And who uh, says, uh, she wrote an article uh, saying that the people who were writing on the walls in, how do you pronounce it, Oaxaca? Oaxaca. Uh, yeah. uh, were really the children of the, of the TGP. And in this, um, in I guess it was 2007, there was a big demonstration uh, on the part for, for education or, or in, well, or education was one of the big issues. Well, in 2006, actually, there Six, was an okay. uprising. It wasn't just a demonstration, but it was a, a basically from April to November, the city was barricaded, um, and people were uh, opposing the state government and the policies of closing teachers' schools and um, the attacks on teachers' demonstrations. So the whole city of Oaxaca rose up against um, the repressive politics of the governor of Oaxaca. And during that time, the entire core, central core of the historic center of Oaxaca was covered with posters and stencil graffiti and paintings. And it became a phenomenon. Of, you know, it was recognized worldwide, but it was for, for month after month. And then for years afterwards, including up till now, if you go to Oaxaca, as with many big cities, you'll see um, tremendous amounts of political graffiti, and some of it's painted, some of it's stenciled, but it's at a very high level, and a lot of it refers directly to TGP imageries, imagery, and a lot of it has to do with calaveras or posada, Lots refers back to the Mexican Revolution. Mm. It's, it has a lot of continuity with the past, but it's very contemporary, and even some of it refers to the world situation. When I was there a couple of years ago, um, the artists of one major group that was called Asaro, they're the most well-known of the groups in Oaxaca, had done a, a number of um, banners, like the banners that the TGP used to do, the telones, 
um, that were prints on banners, and they referred to the Arab Spring. So there were mm. about eight of them, and they were large scale um, with you know direct, direct reference to what was going on in the Middle East. Again, the international focus of you know Mexican political art. So it's yeah. a very very interesting aspect. Well, now, are the things on the walls um, allowed to stay there by the authorities? I mean, are these kind of more or less, uh, I mean, are they, are they anti-government? Are they mm, sort of neutral? It, dur during the uprising in 2006, they, they were there because the government lost control of the city, basically. Mm. Um, and then eventually, in November, they moved into the city with tanks, and they went around and uh, washed everything off the walls. And then, since then, the artists keep putting things up, and they have brigades of paint of um, people that paint over. They call them the gray brigades because they take gray paint and paint over them. But they keep c putting them back up. And Good. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. So. I'd like to say actually yeah. on, on that point. So, you know, a lot of what's in the exhibition right now is is ephemeral. We're looking at political posters and leaflets and. Um, materials that, that are, it's, it's quite miraculous, honestly, that we have these in front of us. Um, you know, th the TGP had a kind of an alternate production of fine artworks, and that's usually what you see uh, in museum exhibitions and in private collections are the fine art prints that they made in large part to finance their operations. Um, but their heart was in the ephemera, was in the posters and uh, in the propaganda that they produced. And, the goal, and this was something, an idea that was really pioneered by Siqueiros, was uh, that graphics was unique in its ability to be used as an effective propaganda tool. That it was the multi-reproducibility and the cost effectiveness of printing on paper. And um, I mean, the TGP is the Taller de Grafica Popular for a reason. It's, I mean, they were really committed to graphics as, as the tool that needed to be used to spread their propaganda. And uh, to that end, they produced these materials as cheaply as they possibly could to be able to produce as many as they could and, and distribute them as widely as they could. And what that means is that the paper is terrible. It's, you know, it's short fiber. To, it's like newsprint. Um, the inks were high in acid. They were not good inks. It wasn't meant to last. It was meant to be up on that wall for the two weeks that it was politically relevant. And then the rains would come and it would melt or someone would p poster something up over it or tear it down. And um, you know, I've handled these materials in institutions where they are, they're crumbling the way old newspaper crumbles, where, you know, if, if they get the slightest angle, they start to turn, turn to dust in your hands. So it, it is truly amazing that these materials are framed and up on a wall uh, at Yale University Gallery. Well, um, I, I do want to say our paper conservator is sitting hey. out there. And she, <laughs> she has, She's done an extraordinary, extraordinary job. But yes, we're all aware of how, yeah. how fragile these, these are. They were not meant to last. Right. And so even, even better that, yeah. that, that they have. But um, now, Octavio, you said something about a collective work. It had Dominican in the uh, title yes. of the group. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. Um, it was a group that I met at uh, in a in a local bookstore in up uptown Manhattan. Um, what's the bookstore called? Uh, Word, up. Word Up Bookstore, which uh, is a uh, it started up as a pop up bookstore in the neighborhood, and um, it, there was such a huge reaction to it from the community that it's actually become a permanent bookstore now and they have their own workspace. And part of what they do is they sell books and also bring in artwork. And one of, and Upper Manhattan is a predominantly Dominican area. And one of the uh, exhibits that they had was this Dominican York Grafica. And as part of that exhibit, there was also a, a workshop to teach uh, lithography. They used uh, little styrofoam papers and pens and ink blotters and um, you know but when I saw the exhibition it was so reminiscent of what we're seeing uh, in your collection and our collection um, and in the way that they worked was also reminiscent and that it was a collaborative effort that they chose a theme and each one would create an art piece around that theme and that it's politically motivated as well. So. I, I think one of the interesting things is whether, whether the taillere is of its time. I often think 
Um, what's, the, what's the current version of political graphics? How has television changed this? If you think of Maidan in Kiev, or you think of uh, other great protests, is there a user-generated content, not organizational content like this? How, what's the political economy of posters? It's Twitter. Yeah, so <laughs> this, this is a, a really interesting question of whether the Dominican community is trying to con create something which existed at a time, but doesn't have the same resonance at the present, at the present moment. Mm -hmm. But there are other things that people do in terms of how they represent themselves, how they uh, depict themselves, et cetera, et cetera, which is, which is different. And I, and I think it's a really interesting problem to know what the, how, how, this, how this movement idea changes over time, over technologies, and uh, over opportunities, basically. Yeah, I actually think your, your, your question is very good. But I think that the, one of the answers is that when it, comes, when it boils down to it, as Noah was saying, it's about the graphic. It's the grafica. It's the image that is being produced. What's interesting now is that the ability to broadcast that image globally has become much more democratized. Uh, and so a group like Dominican York, even though they may be, you know, they're of today, and they may be using uh, an older style of art to make prints, their impact is much more immediate and um, broader uh, glob on a global scale. Uh, and it all boils down to how strong is that graphic that they're actually creating. Because right now, they can put it out there on Twitter and on Facebook and uh, you know, wherever, and YouTube, and it can be seen by millions of people. And it'll be there forever. Right, it'll <laughs> never go away. <laughs> Not gonna wash <laughs> off in the, in the rain. <laughs> Yeah, well, we have time for, um, not very much time, but time for a few questions, if there are questions from the, from the audience. Is there somebody with a, a mic out there? Or are there, uh, are there questions? Yeah, there's some. Hi, is that on? <laughs> Did have one question. It seems that the TGP operated relatively unfettered whether over a continuous period of time or over a period of time, was that because their commercial work and connections allowed them to be radical and to promote their political art? Was it commercial from nine to five and then from five to midnight be radical? How did that all operate for such a continued period of time? Uh, well, I, I, I don't know if I would say that they were purely unfettered. I, I think that they when the group was originally founded, they, they recognized the danger of, of getting into bed with the power structure. And, and many people, um, including the artists, cite that as the, the biggest cause of the downfall of the previous group, which was this League of Revolutionary Writers and Artists. Uh, so they were well aware that there were, that there were strings attached. Um, and I think that they were, uh, they were impoverished. I mean, these artists were not Diego Rivera and Siquero San Orozco. They were not uh, and they weren't after that either, but it meant that they lived in real poverty and, and there was always financial hardship at the taller. And at some point, they struck deals with the government or they, uh, they had a connection in a ministry and they, they, they were adept, I think, at using those connections. But they also, at times, I think, paid a price for their ideas. I mean, I don't think it was easy to be a... Uh, a critic of the, of the regime. And in many cases, that's what they were. And I think a lot of the images upset people in, in places of power. And, in, and there are very real instances, as, as the artists were talking in this video, where they, they paid a real price. They were taken to jail, or they were intimidated um, or persecuted. Um, so I think, it was, I think it was complicated. I think it was complicated for a long time, and it may still be today. Uh, to add, add to that, the, the structure of the group was such that it was a collective, and they had a, a studio, not even a very big studio, which had several locations. And they came and went very freely, usually in the afternoons. And most of them had jobs, um, many of them had jobs as school teachers, so they had day jobs. And as a collective, it didn't have, they didn't produce works to sell that really benefited them very much on a you know, large scale. In fact, Siqueiros wanted them to get an offset press, and that was one of the criticisms he leveled at them that they didn't 
that they were producing these works of graphic art on you know old fashioned, old fashioned, stuff, old fashioned yeah. in the old fashioned way, um, and uh, they they that's what they wanted to do. Um, but they would go, they would come and go very freely and just meet on Fridays, in which uh, it referred to that in the film. They would meet on Fridays for collective criticism and creativity and other special occasions. But it was very uh, free form. That impression I get. And um, people might go for a couple hours a day, or they might go three times a week, or they might go every day. It, it, it was up to the individual. There were about 25 people, and they were supposed to um, work um, collaboratively, and they also were supposed to have dues, and they um, were supposed to donate their work to an archive of the prints. So each artist was supposed to give three prints of every print they made to the TGP. But they never really um, made any money. Um, they tried, they had a little store, and they also had a director, a financial director in the 1940s, Hannes Meyer, who was the previous director of the Bauhaus in Germany, and he saved them actually from complete ruin, financial yeah. ruin because he was very practical and he started a press. And the press put out books and printed things for other people, and they made some money that way. But it, was, it changed constantly through the life of the TGP, through the 25 or 28 years of their most active period. Um, then they had another German after Hannes Meyer who also helped them. Actually, Hannes Meyer was Swiss, um, um, but he had been the director of the Bauhaus. Um, but they um, produced fine art prints and posters, and the fine art prints were meant to make some money, but they didn't sell them for very much, you know, five or ten dollars maybe. And then they did get some commissions. The uh, self-portrait of Mendez that I showed was a commission from the Art Institute of Chicago, which just had an right. exhibit of his work featuring that print. Yeah, um, which is just just uh, closed yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. but it, um, th there were tremendous um, discussions about whether they should even be making fine art prints, whether they should do that, whether that was caving into commercial interests, whether it was selling out. Uh, they had a lot of problems about that, whether they should just do ephemera for you know political causes and whether they should charge anybody for anything. It was a lot of complex discussions yeah. that went on in that group. I, I want to ask about several people have mentioned relations to the refugee population in Mexico, the Jewish population or other refugee uh, communities. Could you say a few words about that? Because it seems to me that it, it, it doesn't always appear in the, in the literature. It's Specifically Jewish? Either way. I don't so the, uh, there were one, one of the, the, actually there were you know, a handful of female artists in the TGP. Um, and uh, one of those was uh, Fanny Rabel. And uh, her, actually her last name was Rabinovich. And she was Jewish. But aside from the works specifically about the Holocaust and around World War II and the persecution of Jews, really quickly thereafter that disappeared. That theme, the persecution of Jews, disappeared from, uh, from their work. And uh, there was, of course, a huge influx of refugees, uh, as Guatemoc was talking about, uh, not just during the war but after the war. And of course, there's a, a very big and vibrant Jewish community in Mexico City today. Um, but I don't think that after the war that they continued to, to touch on that theme. There was one actually later, uh, the, the later TGP I think took a stand on Israel um, and not favorable. Uh, but yeah, they were, I think they were, and, and it's actually kind of in keeping with their nature that they would see the Palestinian cause as the, the underdog in a way. Um, but again, that was much later in the, during the, the Tayyar's later years, after Mendes had left. But in terms of um, the refugee community itself, they had a remarkable collaboration with the German community in exile, mainly Germans mm -hmm. who'd come to Mexico. There was a huge German community in Mexico, and it was divided between reactionaries and um, progressives. And they came, in, they flooded into Mexico because they weren't allowed into the United States. Mm -hmm. So they left Germany and many other countries too, but they came to Mexico and there was a group called um, Pro Cultura Alemana, who, mm. who's, you have posters, the anti-fascist lectures were mm. their project, there were 18 of those. And then that um, group kind of uh, metamorphosized into a group called Alemania Libre, which was in a number of different countries, but very strong in Mexico, and they produced um, papers, and the TGP produced illustrations for those. 
Um, and then that group also produced, uh, established a press called El Libro, Lib El Libro Libre, um, and they, they published the Black Book of Nazi Terror and a number of other works by German authors in Mexico. Um, so it was a really amazing collaboration, mm -hmm. very, very strong and a, a very unusual phenomenon, um, mm -hmm. unique in the world, unique in Latin America. And it's actually been studied much more in Germany than here. Mm -hmm. There's more oh. German literature yeah, on Prignitz that. Sense. I think that's what brought what yeah. Prignitz. Uh, Prignitz. Prignitz, yeah. That's, I think, what brought Prignitz to Mexico originally was the exile community. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll say one, one interesting thing about these. The, this is called the, the Liga Pro Cultura Alemania in Mexico, the, the uh, pro-German culture league in Mexico uh, that sponsored some of the, the posters that you'll see in the exhibition. And um, this is really the first commercial contract that the, that the TGP had. They, they had done uh, one other small project for the Workers' University, and then they got this this big deal uh, to produce these publicity posters for the, the uh, talks that were given and broadcast on radio in Mexico in 1938. Um, and uh, it was just very fortuitous. They, they were a brand new group. Of course, they'd come out of this, uh, this League of Revolutionary Writers and Artists, and they were well known there. But as a group, they needed an opportunity to kind of show their ideas, to, to to, uh, to produce works that made it apparent what side they were on, what their beliefs were, that to, to show their propaganda. And I don't think they would have had the finances to do it just on their own. So just to take up these causes and you know, these things, but it was this contract that gave them the ability to do a very visible work and, and uh, over a long period of time, and it really showed Mexico City and that community and the political community in Mexico what they were and what their intentions were. It was very special. It was a, it was a big break for the TGP. Are there any other questions? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, hang on, our mic is coming. I was, as a fellow collector, I was just wondering how you and your wife carved out this area of mutual interest to make your stand. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'll, I'll try to answer it briefly. Um, first of all, I, I'm, uh, I do this by osmosis. I, ha I often thought of forming a group called Spouses of Art Historians. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the question is, what does a spouse of an art historian do when you have to go to these museums and talk to artists ad infinitum? <clears throat> so what, one of my defense mechanisms was to learn how to uh, buy, buy things. Um, and, and also to keep it a secret from my wife because it was never of adequate museum value. So it was a very interesting discussion between us or non-discussion over the, the process of acqu acquiring this work. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, Jake Zeitlin, who is a, a book dealer in Los Angeles, was a very important influence on my taste. and. Uh, I, I bought my first Taller piece, which is a Pablo O'Higgins piece from Jake Seitlin. Uh, anyone else? Can I just add to that that, uh, that uh, this is A. May Price? <laughs> I'm sorry, but since Monroe, I'm sorry, since Monroe uh, mentioned Jake, uh, Jake sure. Zeitlin, uh, he would tell us where there were real fire sales. Yeah. In, in other words, <laughs> there had been a fire, and would we mind buying some things that had just a little bit of burning around the edges? <laughs> and we, we, we actually did that. Right. So we have uh, identifiable fire, uh, fired uh, yeah. prints. Not, not TGP works <laughs> like that. But. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, mention um, concerning refugees, uh, we haven't mentioned too much the Spanish Civil War. Oh, yeah. And the TGP was basically started um, with, with the help of uh, Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas' father, the pres ex-president of Mexico. He uh, started and welcomed these refugees into Mexico. And the Tayer kind of hmm. I don't know the real history of how it started, but I think Cardenas was the one who basically made it happen. Uh, 
Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to say that, I mean, for all the nationalism on display, Mexican nationalism uh, as a result of the revolution, the TGP certainly welcomed with open arms people from different countries and different, uh, different races and genders, and I think that they were very um, open to a, a shared struggle. Um, that, if you, that if you had the same convictions and the same beliefs, um, the, the influx actually of, of Spaniards into Mexico was kind of complicated at one point, um, where early on the people, the, the people from Spain who were coming were seen as um, opportunists and uh, you know. Um, uh, but then, of course, there was a, a flood of Republican refugees. Um, and there's a, a big community, actually, of, of Spaniards in Mexico City from that time. They were anti-fascist, anti and there was, and there was a, a lot of back and forth uh, going back between, especially the group before the Taller de Grafica Popular, the LEAR, the League of Revolutionary Writers and Artists. There's a very strong cross-cultural exchange between Spain and France and Mexico, um, and this was kind of in, in line with uh, the call from, from the international communists for a popular front. Yeah, I think uh, in uh, interviewing them, one of the things that struck me was you know, how varied their opinions and politics were. And, uh, and you know, often when that happens, it's a very tenuous thing to maintain for a very long time. And I was really amazed that they were able to do it for as long as they did it. I mean. Uh, Ultimately, I think it, it, it's, it sort of crumbled under its own sort of like unwieldiness, but it just seems like they must have had beyond their politics just such a mutual respect, and I think that came from their love of art. And so I think that they were able to keep united because they loved art and they loved <coughs> working. And so almost it, it, the the... the the primary secondariness of is it politics, propaganda, or is it art? It just kept flipping back and forth, and that sort of kept the group going. In my opinion, that's what I sort of sensed from what they were telling me. Interesting. Mm. And also, the Taller produced a portfolio of um, prints about the Spanish Civil War called La España de Franco, and it was a little late in the game, actually, 1938. 38, yeah. So it was clear that the Republicans had pretty much lost by then, but it's very anti-Franco and an interesting set of prints. Actually, the, the, the League of Revolutionary Writers and Artists, which preceded the, the TGP, sent members to Spain to fight in the Civil War. Um, and, an exhibition. and then an exhibition and also a traveling symphony. Uh, uh, Silvestre Vueltas was there. But again, for me, this is um, one, uh, you know, one of the striking examples of, of artists who are political, not just through their art, but who actually went and fought. They actually went and, as many people did, actually, who, who joined the international, the international brigades. They were very serious about, it wasn't, um, wasn't a lot of talk. They walked the walk. They really meant what they were, what they were uh, saying in their works. But I think you mentioned in your dissertation that some of these artists went to the Spanish Civil War, but none of them volunteered to go into World War II. It's interesting, yeah. I don't it's think that there the was uh, the, any of the artists actually uh, joined Mexico at, at one point, uh, was kind of pressured into the war, but I don't think any of them were mm -hmm. participants. And it may be, uh, you know, it, I said in my, in my writing that it, it may be that they were just by then parents, you know, that they had kids and they had families and uh, they, weren't, they weren't young guys anymore, so the idea of actually, you know, going and fighting, but... Um, there, you know, there, the, the TGP is, is, um, is a complex story, and there are lots of open-ended questions still mm -hmm. about, uh, about their, not so much their beliefs, but the way, uh, the way they got along, certainly, the collectivism, uh, the way they expressed their politics, uh, the role of Mendez. There's, there's, there's a lot of work still to be done, so if there's anyone out here looking for a, uh, a doctoral thesis, <laughs> A subject. There's plenty of meat on the bone still. But I, I just wanted to just get back really. I know we have to wrap it up, but I, it's just so relevant to what's happening today. I mean, we just we have uh, right now. There were 47 uh, teachers that are disappeared and thought to be 
in mass graves in Mexico right now. We don't hear very much about that in the United States because there's not that much coverage of Latin America in the United States. But then as get, also you have like f fighters from the United States joining uh, both the people that are fighting against ISIS and the people that are that are that are ISIS. So you're you, you're seeing this sort of like going back to similar times where there's there's a type of like almost like destatifying of your involvement in conflict and your politics. I just wanted to speak about the collective nature of the TGP and how even people who don't know anything about the TGP per se but are interested in social activism, they might adopt similar models. Like when I was in college and a little bit afterwards looking to be involved in some kind of social movement that utilized art, video, music, uh, writing, I ended up working with the independent Media Center, and they had a newspaper. I was part of the video team. There was a radio portion. Everything was done in a collective. So similar kind of decision-making processes, similar kind of you know jumping in where somebody else might have a weakness and putting the name of the collective really on there was important. We, I didn't know anything about the TGP, and speaking to how it's you know relevant more and how it's evolved, the. Independent Media Center, while it had a print and video portion, it also it's online, and it's actually a global movement where there's a platform, and it's a, a website, and that's a platform where you might have a New York City Independent Media Center, you might have one in Seattle, you might have one in Mexico, in, in the Middle East, all over the world, they adopt a similar kind of basic platform, and they run in a similar model of collective decision making, and I had a friend who actually, we were very inspired by a lot of what was going on in Mexico and how they organized. And when Oaxaca had that, uh, the protests, he, he had been on the print team, but he actually got interested in video. He went out there to film the teachers and the strike, and there was a lot of violence, and people got shot, people got killed, and he, his name was Brad Will. He got murdered there, point blank, mm -hmm. by by a police officer and there was cover up and never anyone convicted of murdering him, of course, but that brought attention you know, to the struggle there and it even strengthened further the solidarity between the people in New York and the United States and struggles in Mexico and all over the world, really, the sort of global solidarity for social justice. Mm -hmm. And maybe to just quickly tie it back to the TGP, I mean, I, I think that they- That's the end. Yeah, sorry. Um, I think that these artists would have been enthralled by what's available today, and uh, and I think the collective spirit is alive, and I think they would have been the first ones on the internet, on YouTube, on, uh, you know, it was, it would have blown their minds, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you, panel, very much. Thank you, audience. Thank you. Thank you.